Hi and welcome to Morbid History. On this channel we discuss historic true crime, folklore mythology and just all things from our dark past. But today we're going through the Scandi folklore iceberg that I put together myself by doing a little poll and people got to vote. So if you don't agree on the placing, then take it up with the people who voted. Let's get into the iceberg. So let's get into tier one. And here we have our fan favorites, such as Necken, Skogsroa, trolls and things that people usually associate to Scandic folklore. And of course, then we take number one, Necken. Necken is a typical water nymph, but of course of a male variant. He is often seen in a lake or a stream of sorts, sitting in the nude, playing his violin. And boy did he play it so good, so good. He would play it to lure his victims to him. In a magical spell they would sort of just trance into the water where he would drown them. Usually beautiful women in the stories. Sometimes they wouldn't get drowned, they would just follow along and get impregnated by him. But the babies would also always be sickly or stillborn, which in a way would explain to people back then why some babies just didn't make it. You needed these kinds of weird explanations during these weird times. Necken could also shapeshift, and when he did, he chose to be a beautiful white horse. In his horse form, he would be called Becka Hesten, which translates loosely into river horse or stream horse. In this form, he would uh, walk around the woods and pick up playing children on his back. His back would actually just get longer and longer the more children he found. And when he was happy with the amount of children he had on his back, he would zoom zoom his way back into the river or lake or stream from whence he came and um, dearly depart the poor and most likely confused children. This would of course have been a way for parents to scare their young ones from walking in the woods too far or talk to any strange horses that they would meet. Next on our list we have Skogsråt, or Huldra as she's called also. She was a beautiful female, often described as having fox-like features. But though beautiful, seen from the front, she would either have a tail or her entire back would look like an empty tree trunk, just bark and stuff. You could easily see either way that she was a skogsrå, since she would be dressed in very fancy clothing that didn't fit the environment she was in, which was a dark, deep forest. When it came to wickedness, evilness and stuff like that, she was neither here nor there. It all depended on how you treated her. If you were kind to her when you met her, you would be spared most likely, I think. Because if you were mean in some way, she would make you get lost in the woods. Or just give you very bad luck in hunting and stuff like that. But of course she could just decide one day to play pranks. She loved pranks, she was mischievous. Mischievous. 
she could just choose to make you get lost in the woods too. But if you heard her cackling in the woods out of pure joy while you're walking around in circles, you could take off your clothes and put them all on backwards. Because that would break the spell and you would find your way home again. A great tip for you to place up there in your little noggin, in your little brain vault. Let's keep going. Spöke. A short and sweet little uh, entry there. A spöke is just the unrestful spirit of someone dearly departed. Either from a traumatic event, suicide, or just from unfinished business down on earth. It's important to note that this was not their body, this was just the spirit that would come up and try to resolve the issues that they had so that they could rest. A ghost. Basically. And we end tier one with troll. Troll. These were just big, lumbering, intellectually challenged creatures walking about in the deep woods, usually protecting some kind of treasure in the stories. They would live inside of mountains and their doors would be hidden from humans. Many stories just revolve around people trying to find the door into the troll's home to steal their treasure, which she did by throwing something out of iron over their head, because then you won over the troll. Okay. And could go away with all their gold. They would also exchange their babies with human babies, which was called a thing, changeling in English. They would do this in hopes that their troll baby would be taken care of and taken into the Christian warmth of religion and God. And explained again why some babies were born different. If parents suspected that they had a changeling on their hands, they would just have to starve the baby or just plain abuse it. Then the troll would change them back up. Child, there's actually a court that... <laughs> I can't talk. There's actually real court documents of parents who left their poor child out on a pile of dung in the middle of Swedish winter where it sadly froze into life cancellation, was found the day after, and the parents of course were taken into custody because claiming that it was a changeling clearly didn't work back then either. Don't do that. Then let's move on to tier 2. There we have Sjöråa, Gengångare, Draug and the Mara. Beginning on tier 2 we have the Sjö slash Havsråa. And they are basically the same as the Skogsråa or Huldra. Just that they are guardians of the ocean or the lake. Just think of it as the skogsrå, but make it a Scandinavian mermaid. She too was always seen as a very enchanting, beautiful woman. She would sit on a rock somewhere and entice people to just come up to her for a reason or another. She was uh, neither mean, evil, wicked or super good either. Once again it all depended on how you treated her first. 
and it was very important for people who worked out in like uh, as fishermen or any other work that had to do with the sea water there you kind of had to be on good terms with the roa there often offerings would be given to her for example, she could get a bit cold, so you could give her a pair of mittens, which she would thoroughly enjoy, and then she would forever call you her mitten friend. Ah! Too cute. Either way. But not only would you get a super cute nickname, you would also be lucky in whatever endeavors you had out in the ocean. Forever. You would know when a storm was coming, you would get a lot of fish, all that fun stuff. The Sjöro would also keep cattle, but not the kind of cattle that you and I think about, no. Her cattle was fish. And her favorite fish was the pike, the king of the lake. Her favorite pike, because she had one, would always have a little bell around its neck, like a cow would have, but also sometimes a little crown upon its head. If you were fishing and you caught the Sjöro's favorite pike, you had to, of course, throw it back in as soon as possible so you wouldn't face the wrath of the Sjöro. There are stories of people who couldn't resist like, this is the damn finest pike I've ever seen. Look at its shiny little crown. Heckin' fantastic. And uh, yeah, they ran away with that pike. Quickly. But the Sjöro found out at that very moment. And she sent the water from the lake to the ground chasing this man until it almost took him and he in his kind of scared state threw the pike back to the Sjöro. A good choice. Then we come to Gengångare and Draug. If Spöke is the soul, the ghost of a living dearly departed, the Draug Jägångare was the walking, reanimated, bloating blue corpse of the dearly deceased. But this person would not have been a very dearly deceased person. Only people who were extremely mean and terrible and hated people in life would come back purely out of spite as a draug and kind of pester his home where he used to live. The only way to dispatch of a draug would be to cut its head off, which was a very hard thing to do because they were extremely strong and place the head between its legs burn it and dig it down somewhere super deep and hope for the best and seriously just move away from there in case it didn't help because no one wanted to deal with it yeah that's the gengångare drag a reanimated dead person and last on tier two we have the mara the word Mara lives on today in the Swedish language in the word nightmare, which in Sweden is Mar Dröm. As you could kind of guess, this is a malevolent spirit that would come during the night and ride on your chest when you were sleeping. They would come in through your keyhole. Then you would wake up after having all these terrible nightmares, all sweaty and tired because she had been riding on you 
all night long, so you had had no rest at all. She would do the same with your horses. You could see this by them too, being extremely sweaty and tired, and their hair would have like locks in them, tovor, but they were called mar tovor. That was a sure sign that the Mara had been there and ridden them during the night. She explained nightmares, sleep paralysis, and just waking up in a cold sweat. All those things that happen sometimes when you dream and sleep. Well, if you didn't want Amara to come visit you, what could you do? Well, the Mara was known to hate math. A lot, I mean a lot. But at the same time, for some reason, she was very drawn to it. So you could place a bunch of cow hairs in a psalm book in your room. The Mara couldn't help herself to start counting each hair, which was kind of an impossible task to do during one night. She would give up. And she would leave your house and find another house that wasn't as smart and she would not be forced to count there. And now, tier three on our little iceberg. And we start with the Gårdstomte or Nisse. The Nisse was said in some lore to be the first farmer who broke the land where the house was then built. And that he became kind of a helpful spirit. A small little gnome-like man with a grey hat and grey clothes that lived underneath the farm. He was basically there just to keep an eye on everyone and that the farm was kept in good shape. He also demanded offerings in the shape of food. But not only that, he demanded respect. And if he got all that, he would be a very good and helpful spirit that did a lot of things around the farm. He especially liked to take care of your horses. When Christianity came though, <laughs> there's lots of oldie timey paintings of Nissar and Tomtar drawn as little devils helping on the farm. Because, of course, we couldn't have peaceful little ghosts of old men taking care of your horses. It's, it's magic and paganism and the devil. Yeah. That's the Gårdstomte and Nisse. You had to take care of them and keep them happy. And after that, we go straight to a very similar creature, but different in, in its way, Vettar. Vettar were the same kind of, they, they were small, they lived underground, but usually they didn't want anything to do with humans. So they did not live in connection to anyone's home. They could live anywhere, but they were underground and they had like their little families and communities. But they enjoyed causing mischief by entering someone's farm house and either steal things or just misplace them for the heck of it. But most importantly, you had to look out where you went and had a wee, because if you should happen to wee over their home, which I no one would like that, no one, actually, 
they would throw some kind of curse on you, I guess, and you would get sick and yeeted off this mortal coil. Yeah, all that for a wee in nature. And then we have elvor, which are the equivalent of fairies, but evil. They either lived out in the woods, but sometimes they liked to make their home in water, like down in wells or just creeks and streams and the like. They lived together in big communities and they were extremely beautiful and enchanting. At dawn, you could see the mist on a field, and the white mist dancing there could easily be interpreted like floating white dresses, and that was what the people back in the days saw. They thought that the fairies, or elvor, were dancing in a ring, and after that they would leave their mark in the ground, You've seen those fairy rings. If a man would stumble upon them while they were dancing, he would most probably not make it. He would be enticed into their dance and dance away for a few hours, but these hours would in real life equate to months, days, years. And once the man came back, he was never himself, he was crazy. And you would actually say, Han har fått elvan, or he's got the fairy, meaning he had gone mad, crazy, lost his mind. So keep away from any beautiful ladies out dancing in the fields. And then the last on tier 3 we have Gruv Roa, another Roa, another guardian. Gruva is mine, so this was the guardian of the mines, also a very female spirit. She was mostly seen as a very statuesque, beautiful woman, again, walking around carrying a lantern. She would be dressed in extreme finery and her dress would be light grey or even white just to show how magical or out of this world she was. Because of her fine dress that she was usually seen in, miners would actually leave fancy dresses out as an offering for her when they found a new mine uh, to appease her and uh, get luck. Because everyone knew that this mine wasn't theirs, it was actually the Gruvros mine, and they were just there intruding. But the general consensus is that the Gruvro actually enjoyed having them there. She would sit deep down and just listen to these tiny little creatures war working uh, on top of her head, and she would enjoy it. That's why she would also warn the workers if there was some kind of impending doom. Then they would see her in a black dress and her little lantern. That was the alarm system going that they should get out as quick as possible because an accident was soon to fall upon these mites. I'm gonna have to make a longer video about the Gruvrå. There's lots of information about that, so stay tuned and hit the bell so you won't miss that. Don't forget to like and subscribe! Then we hop into tier 4. Yes, indeed we are. And there we have the Lyktgubbe, Strandvaskare and the Myli. So, Lykt gubbe, which means lantern man. 
He was the ghost of a man who had tried to steal another man's land during life. Back in those days, you had these sticks around different, like, they just, like, were there to point out where one man's land started and another man's land began. And these people would have been there and, like, shifted the sticks and in thus way gaining more land. Land was important during these times, so of course they were punished to become a lantern man after demise. Doomed to walk around as a very old, grey, frail man with his lantern and just walk around in the woods. If you met the lantern man, he would most probably scramble your brains up and make you get lost, completely lost. You could have been outside of your front door and still not find your way home. The way to appease him though was to give him some money. He loved money, that's why he became a lantern man. The stories of the lantern man began with a trying to explain Willow of the Wisps. Those lights, you know, what the heck are they? Of course. It's the spirit of an evil man that stole land and his lantern. As good of an explanation as any if you ask me. Then we move on to Strandvaskare. This is just a speciality draug or spöke ghost, depending on. Either way, this was the ghost of a person lost at sea. Strand meaning beach. Vaskare is a bit harder to translate in a good way. But like, you know in the gold rush when they did this and the gold and the sand would like be washed through? That is called vaska in Swedish. So you could say that their bodies are washed in the sea. Yeah. And they would show up during storms on the beach. Usually many of them. So you had to take a wide berth, not get anywhere close to the beach if there was a storm brewing. If you were close to any beach during a very, very stormy night or day, it said that you could hear the screams of these poor souls in the wind. You could actually see them in the clouds. They're like screaming scary faces. Yes. And if for some reason you just went there anyway, you could either get dragged into the ocean with them to also disappear into the ocean or they would jump on your back and stay there until you had taken them to the closest cemetery and concentrated ground where they would hope to get some rest which they're not given lost at sea. Kind of sad. So don't go close to a beach during a storm if you don't want a dead sailor piggyback riding miles and miles to the closest cemetery. Also place that in your brain vault for future reference. And then we move on to one of my favorites, Myling. The Myling was a ghost of an unbaptized child, or mostly a baby, that had been cancelled from their live subscription, usually by their own mother out of shame and necessity because they had been impregnated out of wedlock. 
these babies would then be buried usually like on a little hill out in the forest but mostly under floor planks in the barn at least in these stories in a little wooden coffin and the mother would place something out of iron on top of it like a pair of scissors because that would keep the ghost from coming up you did not want that in many stories a ruckus would ensue in some way over the barn floor. Maybe there was a wedding or something. And the scissor would fall off. And of course the mealing would come up. And they would have the appearance of the age that they would have been. Had they gotten to live their lives. But a very malnourished, sickly looking version, of course. And usually these stories ended with the Mealing taking revenge on their mother by breastfeeding them into the afterlife. Or in some tales just dancing them to death because they really wanted to dance. They never got to dance down there, so I understand. And now, of course, the tier 5 out of 6. So, there we have Spiritus, Gluson, and Bjara. Yeah. All very weird and fantastical beings. A Spiritus, Spiritus, was actually a little creature that. You would either perform some rituals, I don't know how, to get one, or you could just buy it at your local market. It was just like a wooden box with a little animal in it, also sometimes made out of wood, that had like this mechanic thing that made the legs move. I saw a very fancy one, I'm gonna a picture up if I find it again where the, it had a tiny 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 baby turtle in it with which legs moved when you shook the box yeah either way this little box was called a spiritus and and it was and it was thought that if you spit in it once a week or gave it some of your blood once a week it would somehow bring money into your life you would get yourself some riches and also luck we all want that and the church was extremely against these little wooden toys i would actually call them but People did believe in them, thoroughly believed in them, but the church hated them and would even like preach up there every Sunday about how owning one was like giving your soul to the devil because you had the devil to thank for your luck and your money. Can't just run around with a little wooden box with a little wooden animal in it. Then we have Gluson. Gluson was an evil demonic pig haunting the woods at night. It was always a sow, a female. It had spikes growing from its back and fiery red eyes, really cementing itself as this demon pig. What he would do if you ran into it, it would run between your legs and split you right up downstairs. Gluson again probably came out of the necessity to scare your children from going into the forest where they could like meet real 
scary animals like wolves and stuff like that so it's better to say that they shouldn't go there because of demon pig apparently just saying there's big dogs with giant fangs that will eat you no it's a demon pig and he's gonna split you up between your legs or i mean she 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 Sorry for misgendering the demon pig. Then we move on to the Bjara. The Bjara was a very common familiar to the witch. AKA any weird woman in the village. If your neighbor had better luck with their milk, their cows just like did their job better. That didn't mean that your cows were bad cows. That meant that the wife in that family was obviously a witch and she had gone out to the local cemetery to dig up a freshly buried infant and cut off its finger and done some spells around it took some dirt from the grave and like num 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 and made a little ball into it and from there they made a hair a milk hair also called Bjara the Bjara's mission in life was to go at night and suckle the teats of your neighboring cows and there steal their precious milk and then come back to the witch who had a pukeshal which translates into vomit bucket where the bjara would then throw up the milk for that family to use and consume the milk hair, the Bjara, was such a well-known phenomenon that you can see very beautiful paintings, usually in church walls and roofs of uh, witches and their puking hairs. Yep. And the lore of the Bjara was of course born out of the extreme necessity of milk during these ages i mean you needed milk to make butter cream cheese just everything needed milk so milk was important and it was always fun to poke fingers at any weird lady and if that meant that that weird lady had made themselves a biara and had a little vomit bucket and the hair. Mm. And now let's get on to the last layer. The least well-known creatures from Swedish folklore. And there we have Nattram, Askfrun and the Kyrkogrim. A nattram was closely related to the myling. It was an unbaptized baby that had been buried out or like just put out into a cold dark wood to succumb all by themselves. It was told that during night these spirits would come alive as very scary looking black ravens they didn't have any eyes they just had holes in their eye sockets which like if you saw it and looked into them you would just pass this raven would just fly all night long and its main destination was the grave of the man you know jesus Christ, Jesus is Christ's grave. And there they would hopefully find peace, was the story. Really not much more to that. 
let's move on. Then we have Askfrun or the Ash Wife. She was a spirit that lived inside of an ash tree. Ash trees were seen as especially magical and people would often have rituals and bring offerings to a big ash tree to appease the lady living inside and there's like not much more like to that but if you if you happen to wee on her roots you would get sick and cancelled not a lot of creatures in scandinavian folklore enjoy getting we on them understandable and then we have the Shirko Grim. A Shirko Grim was the guardian of a church. They could take any form because basically to make a Shirko Grim you had to sacrifice the first living thing that walked into the area where a new church would be built. So before the church was even built. It, it could be a cow, a chicken, a horse, whatever, a dog. And then you had to take it and bury it alive on the grounds for it to come back as a monstrous version of itself to guard the place. There are stories of them taking old women and burying them. But the worst ones are, of course, if... A little child happened to waltz into the spot, which are the generally most common stories because children were seen as especially good guardians because of their innocence. Stories usually tell that they dig a hole and trick the child into the hole with a with food a sandwich and while they're there sitting eating their sandwich they start throwing dirt on it and the child gets sad because they're throwing dirt on their food not because they're impending doom their food is getting dirty which was supposed to show just the innocence part again so yeah the shirko games general duties was to scare away youngsters who were out partying in the churchyard at night and scare away any draugs or spöken or other creatures who tried to get in to sacred ground and all that fun stuff forever haunting i mean guarding So yeah, that was the last tier of the Scandi Folklore Iceberg. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know down below what you thought. I really enjoy hearing your comments and feedback and everything like that. It really makes it all worth it. What creature was your favorite and who do you want to hear more of? Many of them I actually already have videos on. and. Most of them I will be making videos on in the future, so stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for watching this little jauntily macabre channel of mine. Remember to hit the bell so you don't miss further morbid content. And a giant thanks to all my lovely, lovely Patreons. I wouldn't be here without you. You're all my heroes. Thank you. And yeah. Beyond that, stay amazing, stay hydrated, and stay morbid. And I'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.